High that crossed the water from Southampton in Hampshire was once the site of one of the most progressive boatyards in the world, which was to revolutionise powerboats and play a significant role in the Second World War. In 1927, it was Hubert Scott Payne that founded the British Powerboat Company and designed and raced the record-breaking speedboat Miss Britain 3, now on permanent display at the Greenwich Maritime Museum. But at one time, the British Powerboat Company had 2,500 employees, including 800 apprentices and 1,000 women. Yet the site of the boatyard is now a housing estate reclaimed from the sea, so who will remember their contribution? Fortunately, there are still employees willing to share their experiences, and thanks to the estate of the late George Biddlecombe, there are a series of still photos of the development of the boatyard now in the public domain. There was a fire in 1931 that completely destroyed the original yard, but Hubert Scott Payne was determined to start again. William Mark remembers the new canteen that was built that was reputed to be the finest on the south coast. He recalls the visit of Sir Kingsley Wood of the Air Ministry in 1939 and how business picked up, especially with the coming of the war. Frank Curtis went to the British Powerboat Company in 1934 at the age of 15. He explains how Hubert Scott Payne's apprenticeship scheme transformed job prospects in the area. Beforehand, People were either labourers or followed their father's footsteps. But afterwards, you could serve a three-month trial period, and if you proved capable, were given a seven-year apprenticeship. All you needed were two good character references. With the outbreak of the war, he joined the Home Guard Commando Unit at Hive, which was run with Imperial Airways next door. They had a machine gun post on the water tower. In case of invasion, their role was to sabotage the yard. He remembers the barrage balloon at the end of the Hive Pier shot down by an enemy aircraft. Frank Curtis says, I met my wife Valerie at the Bowerboat Company. She was formerly a secretary but trained at Marchwood Park as a sheet metal worker. It was very different from secretarial work but she loved every minute of it. Scott Payne, he says, was a very commanding figure. Anti-union, he would find out the union rates, then pay more to keep the union out of the factory. Also, if there were any machinery anywhere that he could read about and thought would be an improvement, he would send someone along with a blank check to assess and buy it. I learned a lot at the powerboat company. Bill Hoppy Wilson says, I was given the privilege after much discussion of bringing in a scheme called the Three Principles based on good timekeeping, good discipline and progress in craftsmanship. Later, my efforts were to result in Frank T. West, Principal of Southampton College of Technology, inviting me to the college, and we framed careers in industry, which later went on to become a nationwide scheme. Harry Gigg says, before I joined the powerboat company, I had only existed in jobs that were hard, austere, dismal and cheap. I never dreamt I could be so affected by the brightness, order and free expression that existed there. He goes on to say, after working at the powerboat for a couple of years, I began to realise that the whole place and its attitude towards the workers was something special. My views had changed. My standards had become much higher. When war was declared, we were told not to enlist as our work was important. The high standard of work was maintained throughout the war and our MTBs did great work during the Battle of Britain, rescuing our airmen and fighting German e-boats. Derek Humby was friends with Tommy Cooper, the well-known TV comedian and magician. He was also an apprentice at the same time. Even then, he was always making people laugh. On Saturdays, we often went into town with Tommy to a place called The Ditches and had faggots and peas. Then we went to a place called Karachi for a cup of tea. The man who ran the place fascinated Tommy with all the tricks he knew and taught him several, including the handkerchief trick. Tommy would often practice the tricks he'd learned on the lads back at the factory. Aileen Hoskins remembers D-Day. Some mornings a ferry would leave from the pier, other times from the Itchen floating bridge. Southampton water was full of landing craft, and so we knew something big was in the offing. On the 6th of June we crossed over to Hyde, and there was not a craft in sight. It was uncanny. 
Jeff Smith recalls my first job I remember was cutting six exhaust pipe holes in the transom of an MTB. The inspector who came to inspect the finished work was a man a little older than myself, who a few years earlier had been a fellow chorister at nearby Ealing Church. At least once a week, there would be a lunchtime entertainment and a canteen workers' playtime. Music and popular songs were played at certain times over the work public address system. Who can forget Run Rabbit and Hang Out the Washing on the Sea Feed line? Dennis Olden says he will never forget the powerboat company as it was a special place to be. You had proper equipment, everything was perfect. They set a very high standard which was a forerunner for many other firms. The training was very thorough and complete instruction in the construction of shipping vessels. Groundwork was always done beforehand. There was no looking for work or making it up as you go. Everything was prepared for you, a stage at a time. James Child, having spent half his time in higher education dealing with the design and manufacture of small craft, realised how advanced the organisation of production was at the Hive Yard in those days. The layout of the yard and its workshops, the plant, the equipment provided and the general cleanliness of the facilities were all of a high order and obviously enabled high levels of production as did the extensive use of purpose-designed jigs and other manufacturing aids. Bill Silence talks about the training at the centre at Marchwood Park. As I had by then a fair bit of experience supervising female labour, I was asked to go to Marchwood Park, where in 1940 the firm was establishing a training unit for female labour. The prospect was a bit daunting as I was still single and aged only 27 years. The courses for girls, residential and daily, last about two months each course, both for woodworking and engineering. I was the engineering instructor, and as well as teaching basic engineering terms and how to read a drawing and use measuring equipment, I also instructed on turning, centre lathe, capstan setting, welding, sheet metal, soldering, raising and bench work. By 1943, we had trained enough female labour to cover all foreseeable needs, but the woodwork and engineering sections were kept open for air crew rehabilitation when we were taken over by the RAF as a unit where burned air crew came to convalesce and learn new skills. Hubert Scott Payne spent the war years in America and stayed on at the end of hostilities. He suffered a stroke in April 1946 and after a long illness died in 1954 production of boats at Hive had much reduced after the war and the decision was taken to close down the yard late in 1946. Nevertheless, the contribution and achievement of the workers during that period should not be forgotten.